Good morning. Raise your hand if you'd like to win. Nice. I study why some people win and some people lose. And what I found is there are very specific patterns for why some people win. It's those people who understand that they have a competitive advantage. And so while I was doing research, I did an interview with a world-class poker player. This is somebody who goes to Vegas and regularly wins million-dollar pots. And I said to him, at the highest level of play, what is the difference between someone who wins and someone who goes home empty-handed? And he told me something I'll never forget. He said, at the highest level of play, poker is not a game of luck. It's not a game of skill. Poker is a game of understanding how people see you and the cues that you intentionally or unintentionally share with everybody else. And the more that you can understand how other people see you, the more that you can have a competitive advantage. Now, I propose the same is true for you in commerce, in work, in your life. The more that you can understand how the world sees you, at the highest level of play, you have a competitive advantage. But if you don't know how the world sees you, you might be playing to a disadvantage. So how does the world see you? How does the world see you at your best? What if you could measure this? What if you could measure what makes people convinced by you, impressed by you, attracted to you? What if you could have a specific system so that when you sat down, you had all the data you needed to be able to impress and influence that person on the other side of the boardroom? What if there was a way that you could capture the exact words to have in your LinkedIn profile or your Twitter bio? What if you knew that when you were talking to somebody out here in the hallway, you had an app that could tell you exactly the words that you should use based on your own natural advantages? Well, this would be a very new way of thinking. Up until now, it's all been about how you see the world. We know how you see the world. Raise your hand if you've done a test like Mars Briggs, Strengths Finder, DISC, Colby. Yeah, the, these, these tests are great and they give us a really important metric. And that metric is how you see the world. They're built on the science of psychology. So that's helpful. It's good to know how you see the world if you live on a desert island. But if you actually have to connect to communicate to convert, you need different data. You need new data points. And those data points are this. You need to know how the world sees you. You need to know what people value from you. What does your customer really want from you? How are you most likely to contribute? Imagine if you had this data, it would completely transform how you could go into meetings, how you'd make presentations, how you'd lead conference calls, and how you would be most likely to add value to your company. Well, this becomes extremely important today. These are the three, face, the three threats that you face every time you communicate, in your branding, in your marketing, in your meetings, every piece of communication. Distraction, competition, commoditization. And I'm going to start with the first of these, distraction. The average attention span used to be 20 minutes long. Today, according to the BBC, nine seconds. Now, we all know that attention spans are getting shorter, but I want you to actually think about this. This isn't just your customer who's reading an ad or somebody who's following your Twitter feed. This means that every time you raise your hand to speak in a meeting, you, only, you may only get nine seconds before their brains unintentionally readjust to their iPhone, to their next meeting, to something else that's going on. Now, this is really troubling because <laughs> nine seconds is the same attention span as a goldfish. So here you are, you're trying to make a point, you're trying to get your point across, and you're talking to a goldfish. I want you to think about this the next time you write a tweet, the next time you stop by somebody's office, they're a goldfish. And what this means is we have to radically change how we build messages and how we add value because every time you communicate, you do one of two things. Every time you communicate, you are either adding value or you're taking up space. If you're adding value, people want to come to you for more. If you're just taking up space, you become almost like human spam. So the question is, how can you add more value? Well, many of the answers lie not just in science, they lie in the art of branding. And if you look at how brands take countless numbers of data points and they put them together into a tagline, you see how exquisitely efficient great brands are. 
These are the first brands that I worked on. I began in my first decade as a creative director. I was the number one most award-winning copywriter by the age of 24. I opened up my first agency at 27. I was part of the team that launched the Mini Cooper in the United States. My very first client was Nike. Tell me what is the Nike tagline? Hey, you know what? In spirit of just do it, I want you to just do it and say a little bit louder. Nice. So when Nike says just do it, they're not talking about shoelaces and rubber soles. Nike's talking about a whole culture. Nike's summarizing a whole ethos, a mindset, a rallying cry that's not just about the product, it's about the company, it's about the experience of working out, it's about the person who would buy Nike shoes. And when Nike says just do it, they're capturing an extraordinary amount of data in just three words. Now you can do the same thing. You can do the same thing that great brands do if you can summarize your own value in just a few words. But what are those words? What are the words that are most likely to show how you add value? This is what I've spent the last decade studying. and We've studied a quarter of a million people. And what we found is that your personality has one way in which you are most likely to add distinct value, one way it's already hardwired within you. You don't have to change who you are. You just have to become more of who you are. And when you do, this is how you add value. And it all begins with understanding a new set of data, looking at a digital footprint around yourself, just like the poker players do, to be able to see a new way for how you're most likely to be perceived in a positive way, be perceived as being authentic and confident. This is the data on a sample group that we did with this group. And what we can see within this is a whole myriad of potentials and pitfalls. There is opportunity in this matrix, in this chart. But if you don't understand what the numbers look like, you can't actually make meaning out of it. I'm going to be telling you a little bit more about this in just a moment. This is the way in which you are different than the average population, and I'll describe what that means in a little bit. But the really exciting thing about this, the really cool thing is that this is a new metric, a new way for you to be able to evaluate the kind of customer experiencing that you as an individual are giving, the reasons why your team should listen to you, the ways in which you can ladder up your greatest value to help your enterprise become more successful. If you haven't taken the assessment, here's the code, write it down, no tweeting the code. The code is how to fascinate dot com slash discover and the conference code IBM SCGS 14 now when you take the assessment you'll get a 15 page in-depth report that's going to describe exactly how the world sees you at your best and how you can use that to become more successful and you'll see how you compare to our average population of 250,000 people, including companies like AT&T, GE, Cisco, Qualcomm, Intel, Intuit, the pilot programs we did when we went in and we looked at the high performers. And we found high performers communicate differently because they understand how the world sees them. And I'm going to teach you how that works. There are all different types of ways that you could potentially add value. Millions of ways built into your personality, but there's one way that you are most likely to be perceived as intensely valuable, irreplaceable. And once you identify that and you articulate that, that's when you can really start to make a difference. But it begins with having the information that you need on yourself, and it's not through the lens of how you see the world. Here's what high performers do differently. They're admired for a noteworthy ability to contribute a specific benefit. So they have a specific signature strength. There's something that they do differently than everybody else. They don't try to be all things to all people. They try to be extraordinary in one way. If you try to be all things to all people, you end up being nothing to anyone. Next, they're worth more than they're being paid. If you're only worth what you're being paid, you're not adding value. <laughs> you're just showing up. Next, they over-deliver in one particular area. So they don't try to be good at everything. They try to be really exceptional in one area. So what is that one area? I want you to think about yourself. What is that one area where you are naturally suited to over-deliver? And this isn't about a skill. This is not about what you do. This is related to who you are. What you do is a commodity. Who you are 
is distinctly valuable. So once you can measure how the world sees you and articulate that in a way that adds value to your customers and others, this is how you become a high performer. And finally, people who are high performers don't have to compete on the basis of price. Just like great products that add value don't have to compete on the basis of price to have referrals and loyalty and to grow and to scale, if you understand your highest value, you don't have to compete on the basis of price either because you're not a commodity. But the key is if you don't know your own value, don't expect anyone else to. It's, it's not your customer's job to know how you add value. It's not your client's job. It's not your manager's job. It's not your HR department's job to know how you add value. It's your job. And if you don't know your own differences, don't expect anybody else to. Harvard Business Review, great study, 100,000 decision makers in B2B. They said, what actually, these days, in today's economy, what shapes your decision? They thought that it was going to be price quality service features, the standard old ways of marketing a transaction, price quality service features. And they found that instead there's a new factor, and it's based on the skills of the salesperson. In other words, price quality and service features still matter, but they're not the single most important part. If you have salespeople who understand how they are most likely to add distinct value, then you really have an opportunity of, of transcending parity. You're no longer a commodity. You can add something distinct. You don't have to change who you are. You have to become more of who you are. And it begins with understanding who you are at your best. The greatest value that you can add is to become more of yourself. There are seven different ways that you can add value. As we've studied for the past year, we began looking at brands, and we found that brands have seven different ways that they can add value. And then we shifted our research over to individuals. We found that individuals have seven different categories of ways that they add value. You're already adding value in many different ways, but there's one way that you are most likely to add value and be perceived as intensely valuable. And when you identify what that is, you can just do more of it. You don't have to change who you are, you just have to become more of who you are, remember? So what is that one way that you just naturally add value and how can you do more of it? Imagine if you could build your whole career, build your team, your enterprise around the way in which each person is most likely to add value. That not only would be highly functional, it would be almost a form of nirvana so that you don't have to do the things that feel like going through a quick stand and instead you can focus on the things that you absolutely love that allow you to get in the flow and be most valuable. Now there are seven different ways people add value and I'm very quickly gonna move through them now. First is power, power is authority and control. Personalities with power, as with every advantage, they also have a disadvantage. Their advantage is they communicate clearly, confidently, boldly. They're comfortable having to make a decision, they're decisive. They, they like being in the front of the room. The disadvantage is sometimes they become so focused on the goal that they can alienate the people around them. And so it's important for them to make sure that their team knows where the goal is, otherwise they can leave people behind. Next, the passion advantage. Passion is about the ability to connect. Passion personalities can immediately create participation. When they smile, you smile back. When they talk to you, you want to engage with them. They're great in customer service. They're great in marketing. So when a passion personality comes into work, you can recognize them because they want to talk and create those moments with you. They want engagement all the time. Hi, how are you doing? How was your weekend? Exclamation point, smiley face. So different people in the office, though, add value in different ways. Passion adds value by relationship building. Mystique adds value very differently. It's a mystique is a solo intellect. So somebody who has primary mystique advantage is a solo intellect who wants to be behind the scenes. People in IT have 300% higher use of those in the average population with mystique. In HR, they have 600% higher use of passion. People people, science people. So it, but mystique personalities like to be able to take a lot of data, sort through it, find the right answer, get it done, but they don't really want to get involved in the drama. You know, they don't really want to know how the sausage is made. So here's what ends up happening though in the workplace. And <laughs> tell me if you've ever seen this before. So the passion personality, d doing what they do best, they're adding value. Oh, hi, how are you doing? How, exclamation point. In a sense, it's almost like the passion personality is saying, why don't you tell me you love me anymore? And the mystique personality is saying, I told you I loved you last year and if that changes, I'll let you know. You know what I'm, raise your hand if you know what I'm talking about. 
Yeah, so different people add value in different ways, but the key is that sometimes the very person that you think is totally different than you is exactly the person that you need in order to have a more higher performing team. Prestige is about overachieving. Alert is about detail. Innovation is about change and creativity. Trust is about consistency. So your personality is already using two of these all the time. These are your primary and second advantage. You have a colored sheet in front of you, the matrix, the archetype matrix. And it shows you the different personalities and how they combine. But the most important part of this matrix is the ways in which different personalities communicate and the way that they are most likely to add value in totally different ways. When we work with teams in companies like Intuit and Cisco, when we go in and we work with teams, we see there's not a right way of doing it, but each person on the team has to be clear about the ways that they're different and the ways they're most likely to have successful interaction. And that begins not with understanding how you see the world, but understanding how the world sees you and have each person on the team understand how the world sees you so the team can rise to its own highest level. Now, I'm going to deconstruct the matrix. Originally, when I began studying this with brands, I knew that there were seven different advantages, seven different ways of adding value. But then about three years ago, we had a breakthrough. We realized with human beings, human beings are not as simple as brands. Human beings weren't created in a laboratory. Human beings have a primary and a secondary. When you merge those, very predictable trends emerge. And those trends are the three adjectives that are on your matrix. Once you find out your archetype by taking the fascination advantage assessment, you can come back to this matrix and find the adjectives that describe who you are at your best. And you can put these adjectives in your LinkedIn bio. You can put them in your Twitter bio. You can use them to describe yourself when you're introducing yourself. Let me describe which words you might use. This is the average result. I want you to look at the red bar that's behind me. That's, that's uh, primary power. This is the average result of a quarter of a million people we've assessed. Now I'm going to show you your result. Ready? Wow, yeah, I'm hearing this like a little ruffle of wow, 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 right? So let's go back, let's take a look. Average, watch the red, your results. So what we found, no surprise, we got a bunch of overachievers in the room. But you even overachieved on overachieving. You are 115% more likely than the average population to have power as your primary advantage. So what this means is that within this room, if we were a team, that our team would be focused, opinionated, decisive, but sometimes we would need help on implementation, detail, and execution. So people who don't have primary power can actually become more valuable by supporting the team in rising to its highest level. Here's what it looks like a pie chart. Average population, our population. Here's what it looks like taking that same matrix that you have in front of you, and we put it with numbers so that you can see once you've done the assessment, you can see, do you have one of the more prevalent archetypes, or do you have one that's more rare? Sometimes the most rare ones can be the most precious. If you're a visual person like me, <laughs> you'd like to have dots. There's one dot for every person who took the assessment in our, in our sample group. And imagine being able to do this with your team. Imagine you have a blank version of this heat map, being able to put one dot for every person on your team to see what the patterns are. Where are you most likely to succeed and where are you most likely to fail? In this group, you can see there's a bumper crop of one archetype, primary power, secondary prestige, and this is the maestro. Maestros are ambitious, focused, and confident. Quintessential leader. Hunt the deer, hunt the deer, hunt the deer. They're great at getting things done in, a, in, in difficult circumstances. If you'd like to learn more about this, my book is going to be coming out in July 1st, but IBM has been so cool. They've made it possible for me to share with you pre-advanced copies. So I'm going to be doing a book signing. And my team and I are here, and we can talk to you about how you add value, how your team adds value, and how you can become a high-performing enterprise. It'll be over in the Solution Center right back there. I'd love to see you there. Now, the, the, the key takeaways from the book are the three words that you're going to need to impress and influence others, the in-depth data that we've gotten on how companies add value, and we're going to show you that inside the research, we can point out to you what we've learned. Now, here's what I want you to remember for the rest of the conference. You don't have to learn how to be fascinating. You have to unlearn how to be boring. You've already learned how to be fascinating, but over time, you become more boring. 
especially if you have a brand disadvantage. If you're in a competitive, distracted, commoditized market, it's really easy to learn how to become boring. You want to close up, especially if you grew up with a difficult last name. I had the ultimate branding challenge as a little kid. What's my last name? Hogshead. Raise your hand if you thought it was a stage name. <laughs> People always say to me, no, that's so cool. What's your real name? Yeah, it's really on my birth certificate. I got beat up on the playground for using my legal last name. And I remember coming to my mother, Mrs. Hogshead, and saying to her, why can't we just have a normal last name, like Smith or Jones? And she said something I'll never forget. She said, it's the thing about your name that makes it different that will one day make you love it. And as soon as I got up off that therapist couch, I knew she was right. <laughs> Because I grew up in a really difficult environment. I grew up in a very challenging, competitive environment. This is my sister. She won three gold medals in the, and, a, and a silver in the Olympics. When I was seven years old, she already had two Guinness Book World Records. Remember this, Nancy Hogshead, 1984, Los Angeles. Nobody applaud. So as I was growing up, I was in a, a situation in which I needed to know how to be able to stand out and add value as a seven-year-old because the same year my brother graduated from Harvard. So can, can you imagine? I was sitting there as a little seven-year-old doing my finger painting, <laughs> going, okay, well, I can't do athletics. I can't do academics. Those trees have been peed on. What can I do? So I did what you do when you're not good at athletics or academics. I went into marketing. <laughs> and I knew... I knew at a young age, I knew that I needed to find a way to communicate my value immediately. And so I said to my dad, what if I wrote a tagline? He said, that's a great idea. You could write it about a hogshead. A hogshead is a barrel that holds 62 gallons. It's one of those big wooden barrels. They ship rum to the new world. So I thought about this and thought about it. Can I show you what I wrote? Okay. A hogshead is a barrel that holds 62 gallons. So what's your last name, smartass? <laughs> I'm learn boring. So this is what I want you to remember. Don't change who you are, become more of who you are. The greatest value you can add is to become more of yourself. Thank you very much.